We are celebrating Pastor Appreciation Month, and there is a table in the back for anybody who wishes to pick up a card, say thank you, or if you choose to give a gift or a thank you card or whatever, you, you can pick up some cards back there. They're on the table as you exit the, the main doors to the left. Okay. Also, we have today a fellowship potluck, okay, in honor of our pastor. And uh, so we're asking everybody, stick around, fellowship, enjoy the food. I hear there's a lot of good dishes out there. So we hope that you will stay and that you will uh, fellowship with one another. And I even challenge uh, some of y'all to sit with someone you don't really know that well. Get to know them. We are one family in Christ, are we not? So sit with someone. Say, hey, you know what? I'm tired of calling you brother and sister. What's your name? You know? <laughs> right? And we get the easy way out. Hey, brother, what's up? Ah. Who was that, honey? You know, so get to know so get to know everybody here. We also have adult Bible study in Awana still happening on Fridays at seven. So, you know, there's room for everyone to learn about our Lord Jesus Christ. So come on Fridays from seven o'clock to uh, eight eight thirty, and then we meet in the fellowship hall and we eat good. We eat good. Sister Lucille really cooks good. So thank you, Sister Lucille. And we still are looking, Pastor, for a kid's swing set. Anybody step up? We're asking, we're looking for someone interested in staining or, or painting the, the swing set outside. That's a kid's, not, not the whole playground out here, in case you're wondering. Just that, that swing set out here for the, for the young kids so that the weather doesn't get to it, right? We've got to take care of our, our things, which God entrusted us with. So if God's put in your heart, see Pastor for more information. Also, after today, today's service, executive board, elders, deacons, we are having an executive board meeting. It's an important one, so please plan on attending. By the way, at the potluck uh, and the line, executive boards, and excuse us, uh, uh, um, brothers and sisters, but I'm going to ask uh, the board members to move to the front so we can get our food and get to the, the meeting and, and, and uh, you know, get things accomplished. Okay, and then next week, next Sunday, members, this is for members, we do have a congregational meeting, and we are having new members voted in, so please be here and see who they are, give them the right hand of fellowship into the membership of this church, and uh, yeah, be here, it's an important meeting as well. Also, we have baptism classes starting anew. For more information, you can see my brother Richard Torres back there. He's raising his hands, and everybody knows him, but you can turn around and see who he is again. And just as, a, as an announcement, we are going, already preparing. The web is already preparing for the Christmas banquet. Now, you know how fast time goes by, right? I mean, it happens. So it is going to be happening on December the 14th, you might want to mark that down on your calendar, December 14th, and there'll be more information to come about when we will be signing up for the banquet, possibly starting either next week or in two weeks. That's the extent of our announcements. I hope you all have a blessed day. Pastor? Well, good morning to you. Do we have any first time visitors this morning? Anybody here for the first time? All right, all the beautiful, tried and tr uh, tested, faithful and true, give yourselves a big round of applause. You are here. Let's open up in a word of prayer. We're also gonna pray for our sister Maria's daughter. She uh, was diagnosed with cancer and she has a very uh, crucial appointment this week. Adele is her name. So we're going to pray for her and we're going to pray for you, Maria. We know that you are um, really concerned. So let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do pray for Adele that you would be merciful to her, that um, her cancer, Lord, would be something manageable and treatable. Give her 
courage, give her uh, encouragement, and I pray that she would, that you would use this opportunity to bring her to yourself. And we do pray for Maria, that you would just calm her spirits, help her to realize that our lives are in your hands, and may she just uh, be a calm assurance to her daughter. And Father, now we pray you would bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> now, I didn't plan this, but go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is the last Sunday of Pastor Appreciation Month. And look at the passage we have before us. So you planned that, didn't you? I did not. You know the way I preach, I just go from section to section. And here we have, I guess, a very providentially perfect passage for this, uh, this month. Let's read together. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So the Apostle Paul admonishes us to appreciate your leaders, your shepherds, your pastors, very appropriate. I was looking at some statistics this week and I was alarmed to find that every month 1,700 ministers leave the ministry. Wow. It's a lot. 1700 they call it quits why well some are discouraged they don't have churches that give them potlucks and encourage them <laughs> like we do here some succumb to moral failures they fall into sin some, it's the financial pressure. Nobody goes into the ministry to make a lot of money. And when you live in California, it's difficult. It's hard for churches in California to attract ministers because the standard of living here is so high. Many burn out. Many succumb to physical health problems. Many self-image and self-esteem is just destroyed. Many feel like failures. And that might attribute to so many giving up. Back in 1994, under the leadership of Dr. James Dobson, Focus on the Family put out the idea of having October Pastor Appreciation Month. And since then, many, many churches have adopted that. And we have uh, Dr. Dobson to thank for that. So we have before us a passage that answers the question, what can you do to show your appreciation? What can you do to show your appreciation? So let's just go through this. We have a list. First of all, you can help them. 
We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. Matter of fact, they work so hard, they are so diligent, they do it all. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. A lot of pastors do everything in the church. Now, many times it's their own fault because they don't delegate. But they're so diligent that they're taken advantage of. You know, if we just wait long enough with that swing set out there, the pastor's going to paint it anyway. No, I'm not. No, I'm not going to do that. So you can help them. Just because they're diligent and they're good workers, and most of the pastors I know are really, really diligent, they're good workers, they study hard, they do all kinds of other things around the church, and uh, sometimes ask, well, where are your deacons? That's why you have, you're supposed to have deacons, so you don't have to do everything. Now, look at the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. They took advantage of him. 2 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians. For you recall, brethren, this is Paul writing, our labor and hardship, our working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. Now, why did Paul have to work night and day so as not to be a burden to the church? Because they didn't want to support him financially. So he said, that's all right. I'll just get a secular job. I'll go make tents. I don't want to be a burden to you, but the gospel will be preached. This is an indictment on the church. Look at chapter 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 8. The church had no problems with Paul working night and day because they didn't want to pay him. Again, he says, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Now that's sad. That's sad that Paul had to work night and day to pay for his food because the church didn't want to support him. And this is the Apostle Paul. Now, he needed pastor appreciation. They didn't have it back then. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. For it is written in the law... Of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Why are you going to work the ox and then keep the ox from eating? Why are you muzzling? You know what a muzzle is, right? Something you put over the mouth of an animal so they don't bite or, in this case, eat. The ox is working. He should be able to eat. While he's working, don't muzzle the ox. Let him work and let him eat at the same time. Now, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking together for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope. And the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you... Is it too much if we reap material things from you? 
Verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. So to make Paul work night and day, to make him do the ministry, to make him have a secular job at the same time because they didn't want to serve and, and uh, pay him is wrong. He said those that proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel. So that is, that's the first, you can, you can help them. Now, back in our text, and you might want to put a bookmarker there or maybe your uh, bulletin. Well, you don't have a bulletin today. Um, your outline. Put something there. Chapter 5, verse 12. But we request you, brethren, that you appreciate. Let's look at that word. You can value them. We're, at, we're answering the question, what can you do to show your appreciation? You can value them. That's what appreciate means. Where you recognize their unique worth. You cherish them. You prize and treasure them. That's all wrapped up in the word appreciate. You value them. You value them. Look at 2 Corinthians. Once again, the Apostle Paul was not valued. He was not appreciated. And he had to pretty much stick up for himself because nobody was doing it for him. Chapter 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10. Now, we don't often think about this, but many people, Paul had a lot of critics. There was a lot of things about him that the church didn't like. For they say his letters are weighty and strong. He writes good. But his personal appearance, his personal presence is unimpressive. And his speech, oh, it's contemptible. His personal presence is unimpressive. He's not much to look at. He doesn't dress well. His speech, you can't sit through one of his messages, is contemptible. They're saying this about Paul. The great apostle Paul. And then in chapter 11, right there, verse 5, they've got more things they don't like. Paul says, For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. They're saying when you compare Paul to the other apostles, Peter and John, he is inferior. And he has to defend himself. I don't consider myself inferior to the most eminent apostles. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. Where did all this criticism come from? His personal appearance is unimpressive. His speech is contemptible. He is inferior to other apostles. And yet he's working night and day. They didn't like the way he looked. They didn't like the way he spoke. They didn't like his status. They didn't value him. They didn't value the great apostle Paul that wrote most of the New Testament. Now, you, as you read through his letters, many times he's got to defend himself. 
because other people weren't. They weren't. So Paul, he was strong. He didn't let it discourage him. But he wrote that you have to appreciate those because he knew what it felt like to be unappreciated. Because he wasn't. He wasn't. And that's sad. That's very sad. I remember once going to uh, speak at a men's, a little evil men's home Bible study. This other church. I didn't know it was evil, so I said, sure, I'll go speak. It was Smitty's house. And all these guys were there. And I said, uh, where's, uh, did you invite the pastor and some of the leaders? Oh, no, they'll just screw it all up. I said, what? Those, those are the words. What a little rat's nest this is. This is the little den of iniquity. Little group of rebels. And here I am, a part of you right now. You guys tricked me into this. So I did, do my, I did do my little Bible study, and then I left. I never went back. These guys, they didn't value the pastor. Pretty much in their minds, he was a screw-up. Their words, and the leaders were. Churches are filled with people like that. And if they're allowed to grow and fester and get a little group, they'll cause chaos. They'll cause chaos. So you've got to value your pastor, your elders, your deacons, your leaders, you've got to value them. Now, back in our text, 1 Thessalonians 5, maybe I should put a bookmarker in mine too. It's taking too long to get back there. Here we go. 5 verse 12, we're still in the same verse. Uh, we request that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord. They have charge over you in the Lord. God has put them in charge. Now, we don't like that because we're rebellious, but they have charge over you. They didn't put themselves in that position. God did in the Lord. So when someone has charge over you, your job is to submit to the loving oversight of their leadership. So how can you show appreciation by submitting to the loving oversight of your leadership, of your leadership. It says in 1 Timothy, it says, if anyone, chapter 3, verse 1, 3, verse 1, it is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer, overseer, elder, pastor, those are all synonymous terms. The office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer is one that oversees the church basically provides leadership over the church and its ministries, an overseer. So you have to embrace that position God gave you. You're the leader. You're not a dictator, but you are a leader. You have to embrace your position, your calling. You're an overseer and hopefully you don't have a lot of rebels with little home Bible studies trying to take you down.
You have to submit. It says that in Hebrews chapter 13. Now, if you have a dictator that's really gotten too big for his britches, then you have to confront them in love. Try to bring them back down to reality. Hebrews 13, because absolute power corrupts absolutely. The ministry is not like that. But it does say here in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders. Obey your leaders. I take it you ladies are all going to go up, sir? Oh, that you're all getting mad. Okay. Okay. Later with this guy. Thirteen seventeen. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Somebody else is mad. They're all good. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So if you discourage your leaders, rebel against your leaders, break your leaders' spirits, it's not going to be profitable for you. You're going to hurt yourself by hurting them. Because what you want is you want a positive leader, leaders, plural. You want them to be happy. You want them to be fulfilled. You don't want to be breaking them down and trying to destroy them, discredit them, dethrone them, if you will. That is unprofitable for you because then without leadership, the church, the church is injured. The church is, why are you going to shoot yourself? Why are you going to do that? No, you want to encourage your leadership because that's good for you as well. That's good for you as well. So you can submit to their, their leadership. And then it also says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, it says right here, they have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. They teach you. They give you instruction. You can learn from them. You can learn from them. What can they teach me? What can he teach me? I've heard it all before. You're unteachable. That's a sad thing to be, unteachable. You should say, Lord, give me a teachable spirit to the day I die. Help me to be curious. Help me to want to learn. Even if it's the same theme over and over, I can learn. Because the Bible in Proverbs talks about being teachable. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. Proverbs 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man. Teach a righteous man. And he will increase his learning because he's open. He's receptive to instruction. Yes, he's wise. He knows a lot already. But as you teach, he's open to it and he's going to increase in his learning. So stay what? Teachable. Now, what's the opposite of that? Well, it's a know-it-all. Somebody that knows it all, look at chapter 12 of Proverbs, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is, is he who listens to counsel. He's open to instruction. But a fool, he knows it all. He's right in his own eyes. He doesn't need any more teaching. Proverbs 18, verse 2. A fool does not delight in understanding, 
but only in revealing his own mind. He doesn't want understanding. He just wants to reveal his own mind. He wants to tell you how smart he is. He wants everybody to know, but he's not teachable. So how, how can you show your appreciation? Well, by staying teachable. Staying teachable. And here's another one. Here's another 1 Thessalonians 5.13. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. You esteem them. You respect them because of their work. Now here, here's a very interesting verse in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 17 <coughs> the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. It's a good verse for deacon boards. What is it talking about double honor? Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to go too too hard right here because I don't want to be accused of uh, self-serving messages. Basically, it's talking about that they should be paid. I'm, I'm reading a MacArthur study Bible right here. The little notes. They should be paid generously, generously. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that they have to, I don't know, I guess if you take it super literally, uh, they should be making double what the average guy in the church makes. Now, most churches can't do that. Obviously, we can't do that here. Most churches can't pay their teaching elder double, it says double honor, double with what the average person in the church they asked J. Vernon McGee one time, how much should a pastor make? He says, well, if my people are eating soup, I'll eat soup. But if they're, they're eating steak, I want to eat steak. That was J. Vernon McGee, I think, said that. So that's how you esteem them highly. And that's why you got to pray for a good deacon board that when they put the numbers down, they're crunching the numbers, they're looking at budgets and they're figuring things out, that they uh, take into consideration things like that. Cost of living, what it, what it, you know, th things like that. Now, continuing on. A few more things right here to show appreciate. 1 Thessalonians 5.13. That you esteem them very, very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Live in peace with one another. How can you show your shepherd appreciation? You can do it by not fighting with each other. So that he doesn't have to get involved in squabbles. That you live in peace with one another. Now, we, we are living through a time right now in our church where everything seems to be very peaceful. But there have been times when there's been war. There's been warfare. I mean, where you stay up at night trying to figure out how did things get this bad? How did this group and this group start to despise each other? How did things get so bad? 
and you're trying to figure it out and you can't sleep at night. I had many sleepless nights trying to figure this and that out and trying to say, okay, how, how can I resolve this? It's just so knotted up. Ever try to untangle a water hose once it got all knotted up? How, how do I start untangling this mess? I can't concentrate on studying because trying to deal with this situation. I, I could tell you what it was, but I don't want to do that because some of the people are still here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's really hairy. So live at peace. Get along with one another. In Philippians 4, 2, you don't have to go there. Paul says, I urge Yodia, I urge Syntyche, live in harmony in the Lord. These two dear ladies, good ladies, faithful ladies in the church, Yodia and Syntyche. I urge Yodia and Syntyche, live in harmony. They were fighting. And now throughout eternity, we're going to know who they are. When you go to heaven, oh, you're Yodia. What was the beef you had with Syntyche? We don't know what they were fighting over. But it was enough for Paul to name them. And it's in Philippians. And finally this. You can minister to one another. You can minister to one another. Not everything has to come to the pastor's desk. You have the ability to minister to one another. You can start by dealing with wayward sheep. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Unruly. Troublesome. Unruly sheep. They're out of order. They're out of rank. They're disorderly, insubordinate, rebellious. What do you do with a sheep like that? Take them to the pastor. No. Why don't you admonish them yourself? Admonish, sharply, lovingly, rebuke them. Bring them back to the right way. You, you, you start there. Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. So you deal with the wayward sheep, then you deal with the worried sheep. Faint-hearted, fearful, worried. They need encouragement. They need comfort. That's where you come in. Encourage them. You can do that. No, that's your job. No, that's all of our jobs. That's all of our jobs. You can do that. And then you deal with the weak sheep. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Fragile. Susceptible susceptible to various sins. You help the weak sheep. You know they're this close to backsliding, to going back to some filthy habit. They're this close. You come alongside and you help the weak sheep. That's all our jobs. Then you deal with the wearisome sheep. Also, verse 14, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. The church always has sheep that they weary you. They tire you out because they're special. They're special. God puts special people in our lives so you, you help them. You help you're patient with them. And then the wicked sheep. The wicked sheep. See to it that no one repays another with evil for evil. Some obviously read between the lines right here. At some point somebody did evil in the church. Well, don't respond with evil. Deal with the wicked sheep, not with retaliation, not with vengeance. 
but with Christian maturity and love. So how can you help your shepherd? Well, you can minister to one another. You can do the body principle. You can work with one another. I look out and I see Christians that have been Christians for 40, 50 years. You've got what it takes. You are mature. You know how to counsel. You know what the Word of God teaches. You can help each other so that all the problems don't come to my desk or go to Rawls house. We can all work with each other because we're mature enough to do that. That's how you show appreciation. That's how you show appreciation. So that is appreciation sermon right here on a perfect day. On a perfect day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I will invite our ushers forward. They will be dismissed. Go line up. Get yourself a nice plate. Don't get mad. Let the board butt in line because they have to go to a meeting. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that we would be a mature church, a church that values our leaders, elders, deacons, teachers, heads of ministries, those that serve you, those that work hard. Help us, Lord, to be a peaceful church, to love one another, to work with one another, to uh, care for one another. And now, Father, help us as we take up this morning's offering. Pray that it would, it would be blessed and multiplied for your purposes. For we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.